Yeah, then a very warm welcome to our web talk and uh, welcome back again in, uh, at Charter Foundation for Sharon and for Michelle and uh, for Veit. Uh, welcome you all for this web talk, Marriage of Convenience or Love Match, right wing populist relations between Israel and Europe. Uh, we told you uh, uh, anti Semitic and Israelophobic tendencies within right wing populism are often subject of critical reporting in Germany. We at Charter Foundation are aware of this operation, so we are glad to host this very important talk today. Our main title of the projects of our foundation in 2021 is Normality as an Experiment. And in this topic of this evening, we see in a worst way that from experiments on the political borders, new normalities might arise. So we should be aware of that. And therefore, we have the right people, I think, to talk with in this evening. Professor Michel Knott, our host from Technical University, Darmstadt will present uh, the speakers to you. Thank you, Michel. Thanks to Enter the Coast Action and the European Integration Network for the cooperation. And now that's an inspiring evening. And it's up to you, Michel. Thank you, Alexander, for that warm welcome. And thanks again for that fantastic cooperation, as always, with Strada Stiftung. Yes, marriage of convenience or love match. Um, Anti-Semitic and Israel-phobic tendencies with right-wing populism are often the subject of critical reporting in Germany and Europe as such. And in particular, Viktor Orban's campaign loaded with a lot of anti-Semitic connotations against George Soros has been followed closely in Europe and especially in Germany. But then, there was the incident that former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, during his visit by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban 2019 to Israel, Netanyahu explained that there is a strong connection between Israel and Orban's Hungary based on many things and so on. And everybody was shocked. Um, I mean, at least everybody who listened to that or had seen that. So knowing the European history and the history of Israel and having in mind current developments of Hungary, this has to be an irritating statement. At least it was uh, one to me when I got to know it. Thus, I really appreci appreciate that Sharon Pardo and his colleagues were coming up with a wonderful article analyzing this movement. Uh, and such the idea was born having Sharon Pardo here to present his analysis to a German audience tonight and Feitzelk reacting to his article with more information about European right-wing populism. So Sharon Pardo uh, is from Ben Gurion University of the Negev. He has a chair in European Union um, research. He's a Jean Monnet chair at personam as myself. And uh, he's working about especially the relation of Israel and the Southern Mediterranean at all within the EU, with the EU. And he has published on this and many other topics around the EU. Veit Selk is from Technical University Darmstadt. He's a political scientist dedicated to political theory and a specialist to populism and right-wing movements in Europe. This web talk today is part of the eCost week of the cost action EU foreign policy facing new realities which are led by myself and Patrick Müller from Austria. And within this action, specialists on the EU foreign policy from 38 countries are working together to enhance our knowledge on this topic. So I would like to turn now to Sharon Pardo and Veit Selk to draw us a very special picture of that new reality we are facing. So we will have each of them talk to us 15, 20 minutes statements and this followed by maybe ice-breaking question by myself. However, I would like to encourage you, the audience to already come up with questions for our guests. Please write them into the chat, which I can see and read out loudly then and pick and hint to which guest you want to pose that question. The earlier you start posing questions, the less I will have to talk. So please, Sharon, start. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Knott. Allow me first to thank you and uh, Dr. Veit Selk, the cost action actor, uh, and Chairman Alexander Gemeinhardt uh, and the Shadow Stiftung 
uh, for organizing uh, this event this evening, Phil and Dank. Um, as, as Michelle already opened with that statement in February 2019, during a visit by Viktor Orban to Israel, former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sent a clear message, I would say, from Jerusalem to Brussels and the rest of Europe by declaring that a strong bond exists between Israel and Orban's Hungary, one which is based, and here I'm quoting Netanyahu himself, on the many things that these two countries have shared in the past as well as in the present. Now, according to Netanyahu, Israel and Hungary, once again, I'm quoting Netanyahu, are both small nations, democracies, the chair, common values, and common interests. I argue that the alliance between Netanyahu's Israel and Orban's Hungary is indicative of the enormous change that Israel has gone through during Netanyahu's era, an era in which Israel has become much like Orban's Hungary, a right-wing populist illiberal powerhouse. Populism, as we all know, is a contested concept. Now, I will leave populism to Dr. Fight Selk, and I will not uh, have the time uh, to dive deeper into the concept, and I know that uh, our fight will do so. Now, populism is prevalent in Israeli politics because conflicts concerning inclusion and exclusion of subordinate social groups have marked Israeli society actually since its inception. Such conflicts stem from the interplay of several factors. The tension between the conceptualization of the Jewish people as a religious unity and its heterogeneous character. The lasting conflict with the Palestinian people and the ongoing Israeli occupation of the occupied Palestinian territories. So Israel is characterized by persistent conflicts about the inclusion and exclusion of different social groups. Once again, I do not have the time to develop this discussion and argue with you that actually Netanyahu's own party, the Likud party, under his leadership, became a right-wing populist powerhouse. But I would like to move on to add another crucial layer to the understanding of Israel's radical, radical, uh, sorry, radical right populism by focusing on Israel's relationship with the European radical right populist and Eurosceptic parties and government. Now, I would argue today that in the age of Netanyahu, Israel has become a Eurosceptic country that actually developed strong alliances with populist and European uh, your skeptic political actors. Netanyahu and his, uh, uh, during his, his uh, um, premiership, Netanyahu's Israel was a populist, soft, your skeptic country that actually shared common values with European radical right populists. From the time of Israel's establishment in 48, the country's leaders were concerned with seeking recognition and legitimacy in the world and with breaking out the political and diplomatic isolation that the Arab countries were imposing on the nascent state. Over the years, in order to break this isolation, to save Jews from persecution and to secure the future of the Jewish state, Zionist underground groups in mandatory Palestine and the Israeli leadership were willing to cooperate even with the devil. Among these devils, one can find former officials of the Third Reich, as well as a strong relationship with South Africa's apartheid regime. Now, when Netanyahu came to power in 1996, Jews were not prosecuted in Europe and Israel was no longer an isolated country. Um, yet, like some of his predecessors, Netanyahu and his Likud party were still anxious to cooperate with the direct inheritors of the European devils. 
And these new partners were actually fast to return their love in mutual diplomatic courtship displays. Again, as I do not have the time this evening, I will give you just two examples uh, in, in this short presentation. And the case in point is actually very relevant to Germany. And this is the Germans alternative for Deutschland party. Since the party was established uh, in April, 2013, it has stormed, as you all know, national politics and until last month's elections was actually the third largest party in the Bundestag. Elements of the IFD are openly racist and bashedly anti-Semitic and supportive of neo-Nazi movements. And its co-founder and former co-leader, Alexander Guland, has questioned Germany's special relationship with Israel. Yet some in Israel have voiced sympathy for the IFD and are advocating for closer relationship with the IFD leadership. Thus, Rafi Eitan, a former minister for senior citizens and minister for Jerusalem affairs under Netanyahu himself, and an influential voice on Israeli security until his death in early 2019, advocated closer Israeli relations with the IFD. In 2018, on the occasion of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, Eitan filmed a video message of support for the IFD which the IFD immediately, of course, posted on its social media accounts. In his message, Eitan offered greetings to the IFD leadership and stated, and, him are, and here I'm quoting Eitan himself, we all in Israel appreciate your attitudes towards Judaism. If you work wisely, strongly, and most important, realistically, instead of alternative for Germany, you might become an alternative for all Europe, end of quote. On his personal Facebook page, Eitan further explained his support for the party. I'm quoting him again. The Muslim world and its culture are very different from those of the West. Anywhere there are Muslims today in any European country, one can expect violence and terror because of these differences. And then Eitan also expressed confidence that the IFD would help Israel with anything we will ask of them. In August 2019, Israel Hayom, an Israeli daily closely associated with Netanyahu, campaigned for an official dialogue, an official dialogue between Israel and the IFD, calling on Israel, and I'm quoting, to take care of its own national interests and look at where it can find those who will help promote them. And observing that the IFD has already tried to promote a few pro-Israel initiatives. Later on in May 2020, Yair Netanyahu, the son of the prime minister, literally became a poster boy for the IFD. After Yair called for the death of the EU and the return of Christian Europe in, in a tweet, Joachim Kuz, an IFD member of the European Parliament, turned the tweet into a graphic featuring a picture of the young Netanyahu. Now, while Netanyahu preferred to keep most of his relationships with Europe's populists in the shadows, and in the article which Professor Knott mentioned, we discussed uh, many of these relationships, when it comes to the Visegrad group of countries, Netanyahu's Israel was all out. So for instance, in July 2017, Netanyahu visited Hungary to attend the Visegrad summit. Netanyahu's goal was to establish with the V4 countries a new diplomatic alliance that would have Israel providing them with aid in different fields in return for the support of Israel in the EU and the UN. Netanyahu succeeded establishing such alliance in relation, uh, such alliance and relations between Jerusalem and the V4 countries, and this relationship became closer and deeper. In February 2019, Jerusalem was to host the first ever Visegrad summit outside Europe. While the summit was ultimately canceled due to a diplomatic row between Israel and Poland, Netanyahu did host the Hungarian, the Czech, and the Slovak prime minister at his own residence. 
In the month leading up to uh, and since that Boch summit, V4 members showed their friendship to the Netanyahu government one after the other. In a flagrant violation of official EU policy on Jerusalem, the Czech Republic inaugurated the Czech House in Jerusalem. Slovakia announced the opening of a cultural trade office in Jerusalem, and Hungary opened a trade office in Jerusalem, which it considers an official branch, a branch of its embassy in Israel. Now, since 1967, the Arab-Israeli conflict has really defined the contours of Israeli-European relations. Israel has viewed European positions manifesting sympathy with the Palestinians as inimical to its security and as uncritically reflecting the positions of the Arab world. During the 90s, Europe launched a series of multilateral uh, initiatives, most notably uh, the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership and later on the Union for the Mediterranean, um, through which Europe sought to manage relations between Israel and the Arab world. The Union's linkage of these multilateral efforts to the Arab-Israeli conflict has only further undermined Israel's confidence in the European Union. Furthermore, Israel's isolation within these arrangements may have encouraged actually Israel to seek political shelter in European radical right populist parties and governments. So to a significant degree, the relationships between Netanyahu's Israel and European radical right uh, populists were based on transactional calculations and a fairly straightforward quid pro quo. The European players forgave Israel for its expansion and occupation in the Palestinian occupied territories and were even willing to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, in return for which Netanyahu's Israel forgave them for their historical and ideological links with the neo-Nazis and even their present day anti-Semitism at home. As a senior diplomat at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs explained to us, and I'm quoting that diplomat, the EU has different shades of democracy. With Hungary, the other V4 countries and other uh, European populists, we share interests. We understand democracy in a similar way, and we have the same analysis regarding the Middle East and the Muslim world. We get all the support we need from them, and they are always open to our arguments. As for anti-Semitism, none of them is anti-Semitic. We simply have different narratives regarding the Holocaust. Above all, we share common values with them." End of quote. The rationalization is quite obvious, and it confirms an equilibrium of joint legitimization. Yet, on a deeper level, I argue that the convergence between the European right and Netanyahu's Israel aimed to weaken core liberal EU norms that are contested within the European Union itself. The convergence subverted Brussels' efforts to construct um, normative internal and foreign policies, as well as Brussels' ability to exert meaningful pressure on Israel. Like European right-wing populists, Netanyahu perceives the European left and the Arab Muslim immigrant communities as the main problem for the continent and the key European threat today to Israel and to European Jewry. For Netanyahu's Israel, European populists are ideological allies harnessing ethnic nationalism in an overarching struggle against global Islam. They oppose both immigration in general and Arab Muslim immigration in particular. And as Netanyahu and Orban declared in 2018 in Jerusalem, and here again, I'm quoting this couple, we both understand the threat of radical Islam is a real one. It could endanger Europe by being here at the front line of the battle against radical Islam. In many ways, Israel is defending Europe, end of quote. So cementing this relationship, both Netanyahu's Likud and his European partners of the populist radical right 
despise multiculturalism, detest political correctness, have little respect for international organizations and international law, and they abhor probing and uncooperative media. Netanyahu's Israel did not merely instrumentalize the European radical right to alleviate external pressures on Israel or to blackmail and divide EU member states and the union's institutions. Netanyahu's governments and its European partners shared deep ideological affinities and common values and hostility to the European Union project itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't hear any clapping, but feel clapped. <laughs> and you, thank you very much. Um, Fight. I will directly give you the word. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks for 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 your talk, and especially I'm especially thankful for your uh, paper, which I enjoyed a lot, and I really uh, recommend uh, uh, reading it. It was was highly illuminating. So my presentation is a small follow-up, so to speak. Can you see this? Yes. Is this working? All right. So I have a couple of uh, um, slides prepared. So I would like to start with some problems uh, of the debate on right-wing populism, which is one context of our evening today. I would say one problem there is a conceptual overstretch, right? Uh, nowadays, we have so many populist parties in the discourse, and one could question uh, sometimes if the categorization is right. You already mentioned it, right? Uh, Likud, is it a populist party? It's an interesting question for discussion. Another aspect is what I would say one-sided notions of right-wing populism. Sometimes right-wing populism is uh, equals illiberalism, exclusion, and even neo-fascism. I would say this is uh, uh, not necessarily wrong, but it's only one side of the phenomenon. So we need the next. Ah, oh, yeah, I have a mosquito here. That was it. Another problem of the debate is what I would call uh, the prevalence of a good guy versus bad guy scheme of interpretation. So uh, that the debate is sometimes framed uh, in, in melodramatic terms, right? This is a, a frame of uh, discourse, uh, which functions uh, um, uh, uh, like a melodramatic film, so to speak, right? You have the forces of evil on the one side, and the forces of good uh, uh, on the other, uh, like in a Hollywood movie. Uh, and what I also liked about uh, your paper, that your paper really doesn't function like this, right? This is another problem of the debate, I would say. So uh, why is that so? It is so because um, reducing right-wing populism to illiberalism and exclusionary policy and as well the conceptual overstretch of populism, this misses important, other important characteristics of right-wing populism. That's the one point. The other point is that this good guy versus bad guy scheme of interpretation, this obfuscates uh, one important cause for right-wing populism, right? So, so it kind of distracts from looking for the causes. Right, this moral, uh, moralistic way of looking at it. Uh, when we speak of uh, conceptions of populism, I, I think there are two which are uh, kind of helpful in a way. Uh, the first one uh, says populism is a political style of performing bad manners, right? This is helpful in a way, illuminating, but on the other hand, it could also lead to this conceptual overstretch, right? Every politician who behaves bad, uh, uh, politically incorrect, so to speak, is a populist. The other con uh, uh, concept is very influential in the uh, scientific discourse by Karl Smudde, populism as a thin ideology, right? Uh, um, you have this populist discourse, which says there's the corrupt elite on the one hand, and the good people on the other, and they also have a strong attachment to the idea of popular sovereignty. And this is 
sort of the form of populist uh, politics, and this needs to be combined with uh, a strong ideologies uh, and, and political programs. I, I think this this uh, catches something, but this also um, misses. I would say uh, it's, this is not a critique of of Mude and Moffat. Just uh, if you take the, these concepts isolated, this misses uh, important aspects of contemporary right wing populism. I would say. Okay, um, I was saying that this uh, good guy versus bad guy frame of reference obfuscates uh, the causes, right, or the opportunity structures of right wing populism. And um, this uh, is a quote, quotation by Hockhammer and Adorno. I just found it when I reread the dialectic of enlightenment. And I think they really have a point there. They, they are uh, talking about liberalism there. I mean, it was a different time. It's from the 40s, of course, but they do have a point. They say the purpose of human rights and liberalism was to promise happiness even where power was lacking right? Happiness for even the powerless. Because the cheated masses are dimly aware that this promise, being universal, remains a lie as long as classes exist, it arouses their anger. They feel themselves scorned. So I would say they talk about promises of liberalism, which the liberal order or liberalism doesn't keep, right? This is the basic idea. And this produces uh, anger on which also right-wing populism uh, uh, blooms or, or, or fuels upon, right? So what are then, if we follow this link, the shortcomings of the liberal pro project right now? I would say this is, of course, hyperbolically put here and, and, and uh, uh, not very differentiated, but to, to give, a, to give a, um, a focus of the debate, I would say there are three aspects of the shortcomings of the current project of a liberal politics. In economic terms, I would say that this embedded global capitalism does not work for everyone, right? This is a shortcoming. Another shortcoming of one could say of cultural liberalism is that multiculturalism, the idea of post-nationalism and of open immigration also does not work for everyone. And thirdly, on the political level, the liberalization of politics, like having uh, post-national forms of politics, more liberal forms of politics, this also does not work for everyone. So in right-wing populism, I would say, reacts to these shortcomings or feeds upon them and, and also uh, kind of uh, tries to uh, magnify these problems, right? But what are the reactions? One reaction is uh, uh, one could call uh, uh, retrogradism, right? Like reformulating economic, cultural, and political ideas of the past for contemporary problems of political identity, institutions of the polity and policy, right? Like, like using this as material for having an alternative to the shortcomings of the liberal order. Second point, uh, uh, I found this concept quite interesting from Yael Tamir, nationalism, nationalism of the vulnerable. Tamir says nationalism used to be an uh, elite project, right? But nowadays, nationalism is rather a, an attractive idea for the vulnerable, and not for everyone who's vulnerable, but from, uh, for the vulnerable parts of the working classes, the, the old working classes, this is the idea. And I would say right-wing populism uses this idea and uh, offers a particularistic or nativist welfare state program. Right to 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 make this attractive. Uh, another point is uh, one could call democratic pathos formula, right? A, a strong democratic rhetoric, which is used by right wing populism populists, and this kind of speaks to what Margaret Canovan has called the redemptive side, redemptive side of democracy, right? The promise 
of democracy for redemptive forms of politics. And then right-wing populism has uh, a program of delimitation, right? Uh, these, the whole ideas of, of building uh, uh, borders, uh, limiting uh, uh, migration and so on and so forth, but also a strong domestic orientation, I would say. It's, this is really uh, um, a peculiar for right-wing populism, this strong domestic orientation. And also, this is debatable, but I, I would say uh, it's true. In foreign policy, you have these uh, uh, strong men, which sometimes, of course, women uh, figures, but they basically act defensive. They have rather defensive uh, policy programs. And then, uh, of course, populist regime building. I added the question mark because I'm not so sure if this uh, is something which really happens, if this is a populist regime, which, for instance, Orban uh, is building, or rather a Christian conservative social regime. So I'm not sure about it, but it, it is discussed as such, and it weakens liberal elements of, of uh, political orders. This is, I would say, um, clear. Oh, another mosquito. Um, and then we have uh, overlaps in uh, right-wing populism with the new radical right. The new radical right, I mean, there are links to neo-Nazis, as Sharon has said, but I would say more important is the new radical right. They present a form of post-fascist politics, right? To make radical right uh, uh, politics and policies um, compatible with uh, the frame, democracy frame. Right, and uh, they, they they really try to uh, separate themselves from the traditionalist uh, right and the uh, fascist national socialist right. So this is a, a method of uh, gaining hegemony, of course, right. But this is an I would say an important point. So and where does this lead us now uh, with regard to the European connection? Uh, Sharon has uh, described and analyzed uh, in his paper. The first point is, this is a point for discussion, I would say, that right-wing populism uh, uh, has been treated by me <laughs> here as a collective singular, but of course, there are right-wing populisms, right? So there is, I would say, uh, a variance probably with regard to uh, uh, the European connection and the, the, the positions towards Israel. So, so is there maybe a variance there? The second point is, um, Sharon already has said it, of course, uh, uh, what is the function? of the European connection. Of course, one uh, function is, it is an attempt to solve legitimation problems of right-wing uh, uh, populists. Uh, some uh, have called this, uh, they, they try to get the kosher stamp, right? But it also is based uh, on common uh, adversaries. I completely agree here uh, with Sharon. Uh, for instance, liberal media, uh, the Islam, in, in quotation marks. But there may be also a certain degree of affinity there. This is uh, maybe also a question for discussion. Uh, if right-wing Zionism and right-wing populism have some sort of commonalities and affinities. And then another point I would say, which is uh, important here, is that the reference, the positive reference to Israel in right-wing populist uh, discourse is some sort of a discursive amplifier of the right-wing populist critique of the European Union, but also of anti-Zionist and pro-immigration leftists and centrists. Right? So this is also a way of gaining more legitimacy for, for this position. Another point uh, um, in this context, which 
might be of importance. I'm not sure, so sure about it, but the factor of just of political competition, right? Uh, uh, so political parties, especially in quotation marks, outsider parties as right-wing populists, they need to make a difference that makes a difference, right? And uh, when the AFD uh, um, positioned uh, um, the party more towards uh, pro-Israel policies, this really uh, uh, made a difference. It was not widely, but it was, was discussed uh, in the media. And it was an um, interesting move, so to speak, from a neutral standpoint. Uh, the last point um, uh, is the question, I'm not so sure yet uh, about this, if this um, positioning, positive positioning towards Israel um, leads to frictions with the anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic uh, uh, right, from which right-wing populist parties uh, um, gain voters, of course, and, and uh, uh, Michelle already mentioned the anti-Semitic uh, campaign of um, Viktor Orban, which uh, was mainly focused on George Soros and uh, had clearly uh, an anti-Semitic um, um, uh, motive. Right. So, so does this lead to some frictions in this respect? This would be my last point here. Do I have another? No. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Pride, for this food for thought clapping here from our side. Thank you very much. I have noted many questions. I just wanted to ask Sharon, do you want to pick up something already or should I start asking questions? Is there any kind of direct feedback you would like to give? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I really need uh, uh, to thank you and fight for deepening uh, the spectrum here and, and for uh, really um, giving us fight uh, the theoretical uh, uh, depth that um, unfortunately I was not able, I didn't have the time and you did it in a much better way. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I think you raised many interesting uh, uh, topics. You clearly gave the other side of, of, of the picture. Uh, and I think now we have a far better, far better picture, even though my camera doesn't give us a better picture now. <laughs> <laughs> your your blurred. Yeah, yeah. In a minute, it it zoom in and and out. But uh, uh, I will be happy to take the first question. Uh, um, yeah, I would. I was. I mean, it's actually the first one is a question to both of you from different sides because if the aim is to to have this shoulder to shoulder uh, effort to weaken the core European values, um, first to Sharon. I mean, do you think or? they succeed and uh, what the, but the question which really bothers me is um, what can the EU do to intervene you know to to hinder this effort to be successful and um, also to fight um, what do you think we should do with such an attack or the, such a strategic movement I mean do we just have to fix all, all of our problems, you know, migration, equality, whatever, you know, <laughs> get rid of all the bad things and then, yeah, we have it. Or is there any kind of strategy you both can think of the European Union should go forward? Oh, wow, that's, that's a fascinating question. First of all, I think the question of success is, is very interesting because the question is how do we define success? If you ask me whether that was a successful uh, strategy on behalf of Netanyahu, one might argue that it was an extremely successful uh, uh, strategy because since 2016, uh, there was no one single joint condemnation of Israeli occupation, at the European Union level. So one might argue that this is clearly a big success. However, one might also argue that this is a major loss because Israel was not able uh, to gain anything from the European Union. So while it stopped and, and blocked all the marches, 
uh, against uh, Israel's occupation. Israel didn't even move one single uh, millimeter in, in deepening its relations with the European Union. So while blocking, thanks to the Eurosceptic countries, the V4 countries and, and, and parties, uh, all potential uh, problematic declarations on Israel, uh, Israel completely failed in deepening and strengthening its relations. So, so one. So, so again, the question is, how do you define success? As for the European Union, I think that the European Union is always, and I think that the first time that I heard it was actually at the Shadow Institute uh, when you, Professor Knott, invited a speaker from the European Union who was very honest to tell us, uh, that was the inaugurating, I think, event of the cost enter, who, who, who quite honestly uh, told us, you know what, the major problem of the European Union is that we simply don't know how to deal with illiberal and undemocratic forces. Um, I won't, I mean, I won't say who the speaker was, but it, 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 it it clearly shows again that the European Union simply doesn't know how to work with undemocratic forces. We saw it with Russia, we see it with China, and we clearly see it with uh, the Eurosceptic relations uh, with Israel. Uh, when Israel first time blocked uh, uh, a European statement in, that was December, it was January 2016, uh, the European Union simply didn't know where it comes from. Uh, that famous meeting, according um, to rumors, uh, led at the time uh, the high representative uh, to cry in the meeting. She simply didn't know how to react uh, uh, to uh, the Hungarian, Greek, uh, Slovak, Bulgarian, Romanian uh, uh, move against European Union values. So I'm afraid that for the time being, as we do not see any move towards uh, the developments in Hungary or in Poland, personally, I think that for the time being, I cannot expect anything from the European Union in fighting uh, this, these relationships with Israel. Um, and Israel clearly takes advantage of the situation. Fight over to you. I had a couple of minutes time to think of an answer, but <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> it, it, this is really tough. It's really tough uh, to say what kind of uh, um, a strategy, a piecemeal strategy, right? Instead of the, the, the this big approach, what would be a good idea? I mean, it, it's 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 really tough um, i mean may, maybe uh, um, the problem is not that the values uh, are weakened the problem is maybe rather that uh, people have problems um, imagine, imagining uh, these values uh, 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 more positively in practical political life right so this is really really tough to say how, how to how to answer this. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just uh, yeah? Uh, may, sure. may I just answer something? I, I, because I think fight just touched upon that issue of values, and and this is what I'm trying to argue, here, and it goes really to the heart of of fight uh, uh, um, presentation. The major difference between I would say any other country that instrumentalizes these players and Israel is that Netanyahu's Israel really shares values with these mm -hmm. players. And that's the major difference. And, and in the paper itself, we argue that the Likud today is, is a populist party. Um, and, and, and that's the major difference here, that Netanyahu's Israel truly shares values with these players and we see the fact that the European Union simply does not know how to deal with Russia, does not know how to deal with China, does not know how to deal with North Korea, with any 
non-liberal power uh, the European Union clearly failed to deal with. And, and again, this was first time said in public in the Shatter uh, Foundation several years ago. And, and, and since then, you know, it, I, I just realized that Brussels has a problem and it literally doesn't know how to deal with it. But what would, would you from Israel tell the EU how to deal with it? I mean, do we have to be strong? Because we just had before, we had a talk with a, a member of the commission and I mean, uh, and one of the, in the audience said, I mean, the normative power Europe is failed. That's over, you know, we don't have to talk about that. That concept didn't work anymore. Uh, should we give up and should we uh, be more strategic, be more, be harder? What kind of way of dealing with these kind of countries would you suggest the EU? Well, first of all, I, I beg to disagree with uh, the person who said that normative power Europe doesn't work because, you know, it's not a singular uh, domain in which normative power Europe works. Take, for example, the mere fact that uh, 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 the, 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 the COVID-19 shots were invented 19 or 20 kilometers from from where you are right now uh, is 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 yet another example of normative power Europe uh, at its best. Uh, now your normative power Europe clearly works in the field of research in the field of of trade. Uh, Israel just recently, uh, the new government just decided recently, it will be enacted soon, that uh, regulations, European regulations, any medication, anything which was uh, uh, approved by European regulation will immediately enter into Israel. This is not the situation when it comes to uh, the US, so, so in terms of export import. So this tells you that normative power Europe really works. Uh, we can take this discussion to the, 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 to, to, the, to the issue of Israel, for example, when it comes to civic studies, you know, when Israel is trying to, uh, 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 to explain to Israeli students and kids how come a Jewish state can be a democratic state, uh, Israel created in its textbooks a very simple equilibrium in which is, Jews are coming from Europe, democracy was invented in Europe, hence, a Jewish state can only be a democratic state. So can you say that normative power Europe doesn't work in this region? Obviously not. <laughs> These are different dimensions and domain in which to my mind, we can see a very active normative power Europe, which is working really well. However, when it comes to the core uh, norms of normative power Europe, when it comes to the core norms relevant to the conflict, clearly, I tend to agree with that speaker that normative power Europe uh, uh, failed, but it failed at the bilateral level. I wouldn't say that it failed at the supranational level. At the bilateral member state relations levels with Israel, clearly it failed. But at the normative supranational level, I tend to disagree. Normative power Europe works well. Israel's, Israel's Netanyahu's Israel strategy is a reaction to normative power Europe. Okay, um, so we have finally, uh, we have uh, questions from the audience. So Jörg Kemetzel, our colleague from TU Darmstadt asked, I want to ask about the deficits of political mainstream in Europe that enables the new affinity between Israel right and European right-wing populists. So what are the deficits of the political mainstream? Question to both of you, I think. Maybe or Sharon. Um, I, I think would you say are the deficits? Well, I think that, and and uh, I think that one should ask himself or herself first is 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 what are these values and and we try to touch upon these values both fight and myself actually mentioned islam left media uh the the multiculturalism the pc culture uh, uh so 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 here i think these are the shared common struggles and values 
Now, when it comes to deficits, I think, as I said in an answer to you, Meek, bear in mind that Israel was not really successful in promoting and in deepening its relations with the European Union thanks to this to these relationships, thanks to these populisms. And on the other hand, one might argue, even the fact that we are discussing this in length, is that these parties were not really able to get the kosher stamp that they wanted. No one believes them that they are not anti-Semites. Uh, uh, and, and while Orban declares what he declares in Jerusalem and the day after he fight George Soros in, in Budapest, um, so, so, so we see that, that eventually it's not a win-win situation. It's a lose-lose situation. I have another question from Michael Andres. Isn't the common ground between the right-wing populists from the AfD the, and the, the Israel right-wing populists the rejection of Muslims? Is that the common ground? Is that the, the shared um, issue, so to speak? Fight, maybe. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think we, we already touched uh, uh, upon this. This is, this is uh, uh, so to speak, a common adversary. Uh, um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> common ground and uh, it is also maybe this is a, um, a germano-centric perspective uh, i don't know uh, but it's also um, for right-wing populists uh, a, a salient difference marker right uh, uh, the critique uh, uh, polemic uh, um, against um, um, uh, Islamism and uh, Islam. This is uh, really uh, a quite unique, uh, uh, unique selling point uh, for writing uh, populists. And it is, uh, um, if, if you link it with this uh, pro-Israel uh, discourse tropes, uh, this is a way of, of legitimizing this kind of discourse, right? I have here a question. In, in Maybe I'll just add one, one sentence, yeah. Mick. I'll yeah. just add that, as, as we already said earlier, it's really ethnic nationalism. So it's not just Islam and Muslims. It's really ethnic nationalism and immigration. Immigration in particular, Muslim immigration, but immigration at large. So it's not just Islam and Muslims and, and multiculturalism and, and correctness. So here, I think it's, it's mm. a bit deeper than just global Islam. Yeah. I have a question here in the chat uh, in, in the same way or same direction. Could one say the link between them, I mean, the Israel, Orban and so on, uh, is a kind of anti-values that let them forget their partial anti-Semitism. And the question is also how is the reception in Israel itself on this relation, on this new relation? So is that an anti-value and then the question of the reception in Israel? I think that it's, again, they both despise normative power Europe okay. uh, uh, to the extent that normative power Europe uh, is very problematic to the Orban administration. And normative power Europe, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is very problematic to the Netanyahu's governments. Uh, uh, so, so these aspects of normative power Europe are, are simply being despised by these two actors. Um, how this is perceived in Israel? Um, well, except I would say, first of all, there's no serious discourse, no, no general dialogue or discussion on, on the topic, uh, except probably the arts newspaper, which is the leftish liberal newspaper. There's hardly any criticism uh, of this relationship and within some academic circles. Otherwise, uh, it is being perceived in a very positive way and in an extremely successful 
uh, a successful way to the extent that just a week before the general last round of elections in Israel, Netanyahu managed to bring his friends, Orban, uh, the, prime, the Czech prime minister and, and the Slovak prime minister to, to uh, Jerusalem a week before. And he was sure that this will actually give him some credit in which Orban literally said, I admire Netanyahu. And, and the two other prime ministers said exactly the same. So Netanyahu at least was under the impression that this will credit him um, in, in the ballot box. And one, maybe, maybe one question in that direction, the new government you just mentioned, I mean, your governments are changing very quickly, but at the moment, the newest one, which is in power at the moment, I mean, do they continue that, that way of shoulder to shoulder with the movements, right-wing movements, or would they just ignore that? Well, that's that's the question, and and you know, there's no simple answer to that. But we already have um, we have a little example. I mean, the the most recent uh, diplomatic row between Israel and Poland uh, escalated strongly regarding a new Polish law that restricts the rights of uh, Holocaust survivors to rec uh, reclaim. Uh, property which was seized by Poland's uh, foreign minister, uh, uh, the communist regime, uh, for the first time we saw a major condemnation of both the Israeli prime minister, Naftali Bennett, and, and the Israeli foreign minister, uh, Lapid, over, over the issue. And here, you know what, maybe I should even quote uh, uh, Lapid, because Lapid said something which we never heard during the Netanyahu administration. He denounced the Polish law, and, and he said that this is an immoral anti-Semitic law. And he, uh, uh, he clearly said that uh, a, a Poland is no longer a democratic country. Uh, and he even suggested the Polish ambassador uh, uh, not even to return to Israel. Um, Naftali Bennett, the prime minister, was actually very, very strong in his condemnation of the Polish law. Um, and, and then another sign of change maybe is an op-ed which uh, the foreign minister just published in late September in which he argued that it's time for Israel to use, uh, to create a diplomatic umbrella in which uh, it, is, uh, it is using a more value-based foreign policy. Does this, mean that we will see a major change? I don't know, but at least there is a sign of, of one must say, one might say a normative based foreign policy. Time will, will tell, but clearly what we saw with, with Poland really didn't happen in, in the past 10 years. Uh, so on that front, we, we clearly see a very strong condemnation of the Polish government uh, uh, using language that we didn't hear uh, in the past 10 years, at least. Well, maybe because our time is uh, coming to an end, I have an, a last one for both of you. I mean, beside the ice time <laughs> with Poland at the moment, if you if we just recall what Sharon said, I mean, Herr Wilders, Strache, Salvini, uh, the AfD in the last elections, uh, can is there hope fight that um, times of populism are getting to an end, or is at least a little bit not so strong as we used to have them in Europe? And would that maybe change something? I mean, would that, uh, I mean, who knows what's happening to Babish with the Pandora papers now, maybe all these people stumble uh, on whatever they have done or the populism goes a bit backwards. Would that make any difference? Give us some hope. That's the last statement, please, <laughs> for tonight. <laughs> should, should I, should yes, I start? Yes, okay. Um, yeah. 
is there coming re, 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 a populist recession, so to speak, right? Yeah, right. Uh, hard to say. I, I, I doubt it uh, because uh, the, the right wing populist uh, uh, political um, program, it, it kind of, there, there is some sort of demand, so to speak. Uh, for it, right? The, the, the question is rather how, how big is this uh, 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 demand? And uh, another question is uh, uh, um, how the, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, this, this regime building experiment, uh, 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 how, how this uh, works out in, in the end, right? This, this is also a crucial a question. And then the, the last point uh, is that I would say that a right-wing populism, yeah, it, it basically is a, a reaction to uh, not only, not only, but uh, to a certain degree to uh, um, problems of liberal democratic uh, policy making and regimes right and as long as these problems are there it's kind of hard to overcome uh, right wing uh, populism so that there, there might you be say a... this i'm tempted to ask you if you think the new conditionality in the eu would work but maybe as you're not a eu specialist i have to ask that to sharon <laughs> because That's we good. have no sharp knife yet for liberal <laughs> democracy within the eu so maybe the new conditionality still to be decided um uh, by the court but uh, maybe that might be uh, helpful but uh, Sharon, please. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, one should remember that it is a mistake, probably it's a misperception. I think that it was Professor Yecheskel Dror, the strategist, who told us that it's a major misperception to think that history returns, um, because it doesn't. Um, however, if we look at the history of Europe uh, and Israel as well, populists were always there. So I'm afraid populism is here to stay. However, if that's any word of comfort, Mick, um, we opened with both actually, both of us argued, Fight and myself, that populism is a contested concept. Now, the fact that I personally see populism in a negative way um, doesn't mean that populism is always negative. And many of our colleagues, some of them, not many, do perceive populism in a more favorable ways. Um, I think fight and myself are to one to the one side of, of I, if, I, if I read you correctly fight uh, this evening, but, but some of our colleagues do argue that populism is, is a positive phenomenon. Um, and, and if that gives you any hope, Mick, then mm -hmm. maybe there is hope. Uh, but to my mind, populism is here to stay. Now, as for conditionality, I must say that if we take, and again, it's a complete misperception to think that history, uh, um, history returns. Uh, uh, if we look just, uh, if we examine Euro-Mediterranean relationships, you know, conditionality, the European Union tried conditionality with the Mediterranean countries, with the Arab countries, with Israel, basically since the 60s. It always failed. Um, and, and my feeling is that at least from what we saw until today, European conditionality didn't work that well. Let's see how it's working inside the EU or not. We will see, we're just making our first little, little steps uh, towards that. So thank you very much, Sharon and Fight, for that lovely, vivid discussion for the last one and a half hours. Thank you to the audience for the question. And we hope we gave you just some more insight uh, in that relation between Israel and right-wing populists in Europe. Thanks a lot. Um, join the rest of the 
cost week if you're interested if you're interested in the paper and didn't know don't know how to access it please just give me an email you can find me with my name in the TU Darmstadt I will more than happy I hope that's okay Sharon to distribute it uh, and then have a good rest of that evening thank you very much bye bye <laughs>